Greetings, trombones at large, Bryant Byers I am. The vagrant trombone here again to uh, talk about a little topic that came up the other day at rehearsal. I was playing a solo and the clarinet player sitting next to me at a Pops concert asked me, what kind of mute are you using? And uh, the mute that I was using that day was the much despised and oft maligned solo tone mute. But that is not the mute that I'm going to talk about today. No, the mute that I want to talk about today is the straight mute. The straight mute is the single mute that every trombone player will need to own, and some guys it might be the only mute that they need to own. Um, every manufacturer makes a straight mute. Sometimes it's their signature mute, and uh, they come in a uh, variety of materials, but there are really only two types that I'm going to really talk about because that's all there really are for me personally as a player. There's the fiber mute and the metal mute. Major manufacturers of the fiber mute used to be Humes and Berg and Shastock. Now the Shastock mutes are actually cardboard with a wooden bottom on them. And uh, as, as I would play on these, the cardboard would start to disintegrate if they got too soft. And once my mute actually collapsed in my mute bag after a gig because it had deteriorated. But uh, they do have a distinct sound and when I'm playing in a big band oftentimes I want to use a fiber mute. <laughs> Right? And then there's the Humes and Berg, which has a slightly different color of sound. You get the idea, right? And then there's the Metal Mute. The Metal Mute is made out of aluminum. And uh, sometimes you can get them in copper or with copper bottoms. The mutes that I prefer are Tom Crowns. I had a Dennis Wick years ago, and it was a very fine mute, but I left it under a chair in a church someplace and just didn't bother to replace it since I already had a Tom Crown. Now, uh, one of the things about the Tom Crowns is that I always put a little tape on the top of them to keep them from gouging out my bell, which, is, uh, which can be a big accent when you're slamming a mute in really quickly. But the uh, Tom Crown has a little more of a distinct, direct sound, a little more buzzy. And um, when I'm playing in an orchestra pit, this is the mute that uh, seems to pick up best onto a microphone. It also, because the larger ball on the end, this kind of bulb on the end, it seems to perform a little better in the mid and lower registers than does the uh, straight, the uh, fiber straight. I've had metal straights that are like a fiber straight, but they suffer the same problems down in the low register as do the fiber straights. So um, the, my go-to mute these days is my Tom Crown when I'm playing by myself in an orchestra pit or um, for a show with most of the things that I do. When I do play in big bands, sometimes if it's second trombone, I'll still reach for my, my fiber mute, depending on what the other people in the section are playing. And that's, uh, that's another topic. After looking at a couple of other videos, I saw that one of the topics that doesn't really get covered is how to train your mute, how to, how to uh, take care of it. Uh, when you first get a mute, it's usually going to have very squared corners on the corks. You can see the corks are very sharp on the corners. One of the things you're going to have to do when you get a mute is you're going to need to take an emery board and you're going to want to round those corks off so that they're not quite so straight. Just take the emery board and shave off a little bit of cork. The reason for doing that is twofold. There are two reasons for doing that. One, you increase the, surf you increase the amount of surface area that's going to make contact with the inside of your bell, so it helps the mute stay in a little better. Another reason why you do that is, well, another reason why you cut down the edges is to help fit the mute farther up into the bell. Now sometimes, as in the case with my bass trombone mute, these corks are so short I never did square them off, and the reason why I didn't do that is because the mute played pretty much in tune as it was supposed to. Uh, as it um, optimally with those corks and I didn't want to have to shave them off and then, and then maybe have to build them back up because they were too short. So um, I never did round those off. But uh, that's one of the things that you do. You just take an emery board. My wife hates it when I use her emery board to shave my corks on my mutes. Fortunately, I don't do it that often. Once in a while, you will get a mute that has really tall corks. And uh, I, sometimes you have to actually take an X-Acto blade to them or, or uh, like a box cutter blade. But uh, I, I don't recommend that. I just shave them down until they're the right fit. 
and you want them to be the right height so that you can get the mute in to the right distance. If the mute sticks out too far, it doesn't have the right color of sound. It won't be as buzzy as it should be. Um, but one thing you don't want to do is take off too much cork and then the mute doesn't work or it, or it, uh, or it drives the pitch up sharper. You will lose register. So it's a kind of a fine tuning thing. If you find that the mute is a little too loose or too open in, and you get too much trombone color of sound and not enough buzz from the mute, you might want to think about rounding off the corners of your corks. Something else that you might want to do with the corks too is if, if you know a clarinet player or a bassoon player or something like that, you may want to ask them to borrow some of their cork grease. And you put a little cork grease on the, um, on the corks. The reason to do this is cork grease is a grease and so it makes, them, makes the mute a little slippery. But once it starts to dry out a little bit, it protects the cork from moisture, which keeps the corks from decomposing. And uh, it actually is a little tacky, so sometimes it'll actually help the mute stay in. Uh, placement of a mute, putting a mute into your horn. I've seen guys take mutes and just drive them in. And the problem is you're going to get little dents in your bell. With these 20,000s, 18,000s bells on trombones, you can get these little lines, these little scars on the bell dents caused by the corks when they twist them in. Really, your cork, on the if your cork is properly treated, you shouldn't have to do more than take the mute, put it in, and give it a little twist, and it should stay. And then it makes it easier to extract the mute, too, because it's not driven way up into the bell, which can also affect the way the pitch sounds. One of the things you're going to have to do with your mutes, you have to do this, is play with your mute. You want to know where every note sits. When you pick up that mute and stick it in your horn, you want to know what your horn is going to do now that you've got this weird thing shoved up inside of it. Um, so I always tune my mute. When you're choosing a mute, remember, they come in different sizes. Uh, in the old days, they used to come in three sizes. They came in small bore tenor, they came in medium bore tenor or large bore tenor, and bass trombone. In fact, sometimes for a while they actually made two different sizes of bass trombone mute because some guys like me played older horns like Kahn's and, uh, and um, other guys played horns that were fifth, Bach, like Bach 50 throat and larger and they actually needed a different mute to make it work. The, I have quite a few mutes. When I was playing a lot of recording sessions and doing that kind of work, I actually carried three straight mutes in my bag everywhere I went. Two different cups, two different buckets, uh, I even had a Harmon and a bubble mute sometimes, as well as my solo tone and plunger. And the reason for this was because I wanted to be able to blend quickly with my section. If I knew who was going to be there, I would take a look. I, I knew pretty much what mutes they would carry, but if I got with a group of people I didn't know, I could just immediately look down the line and see if they're all playing metal mutes. I'd play my metal mute. If they were all playing fiber mutes, I'd play my fiber mute. I once had a conversation with a trumpet player about blend, and he said, you can always blend. And this is true. You can, over time, make any mute work. But for me, at the time, I didn't want to have to take the time to do that. I wanted to just look, stick the mute in, and get it right. Uh, so if you're playing with, when, in choosing a mute for yourself, you need to take that into account. If you're playing pe with people who play on metal mutes, you might want to try a metal mute. If you're playing with people who play on old fiber mutes, if you've got a fiber mute, they're inexpensive, just stick with the fiber mute. Unless you feel like playing some soloistic stuff, then you might want to try investing in one of the very expensive wooden mutes or a metal mute that may have a cop or with a copper bottom. The copper bottom mutes, I like them for live performance. They're a little darker. There are many, many, many different kinds of mutes out there. There are wooden mutes, plastic mutes, fiber mutes, carbon fiber mutes. They make them out of aluminum. They make them out of brass. They make them out of copper. They make them out of any kind of material you can think of. But um, really, for me, it's either a fiber mute or it's an aluminum metal mute. And I find them just to be the easiest to deal with. They've got good response. And some of these other mutes might be better, but when I have to look down at the other section and think about blending, I always return to my old faithful. Okay, and that's about all I have to say about mutes, or at least straight mutes. So um, I may make another video on the other mutes, like bucket mutes and cup mutes and things like that. But uh, I want to just make a single video for the straight mute because it's, uh, it's the one single most important mute that you're going to own. And uh, 
I hope that you found this interesting, and uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. And um, until the next time, see you then.